We want to welcome okay. folks to our webinar specific to dual enrollment. This is the second in our two-part series. Our first part talked about um, the letters that principals needed to send out um, by March 1st, as well as the principal letters once you approve. This webinar is really going to be getting into the eligibility requirements, um, including courses, the students, where, um, costs, everything else. So this one's going to be the the nuts and bolts um, detail piece that um, came out in several of the questions that are there. So we wanna welcome you um, to our session today and thank Jeff McNeil, um, educational consultant from the Michigan Department of Education for joining us um, with that. We will be using the um, Q&A feature. So at the bottom or within your screen, you should see where it shows questions and answers. So please do ask questions within that system and um, you may add um, comments or ideas to chats if you have things of how you've done things, but the question answer feature will be our main piece. So knowing that time is precious um, and uh, we wanna honor your time, we're gonna get started. So thank you, Jeff, for joining me. My name is Colin Rittmaster, Deputy Executive Director with Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals, and I'll be moderating today with Jeff. I'll be paying attention to the questions, framing those for him, and um, engaging with him. But to get us started, um, Jeff, why don't you give us some um, the nuts and bolts about dual enrollment and eligibility. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as we're starting, this is our part legislative requirements number two. And this will be available in a PDF after the event. So you'll be able to get that off of the, the association's website and uh, access this after the presentation. Right. Colin, did we do the, this is being recorded so that people are aware of that? Yep, everybody should have been notified when they entered that it is recorded. So a recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the, um, the presentation, as Jeff said, will be emailed out to folks tomorrow or the next day. And so with that, uh, we're going to start. And so when we look at this, the Michigan's top 10 strategies, this is directly related to goal four. You could say it's also related to goal five and six, but it is one of our metrics that we use to measure goal four. So with that, we're gonna get started. I am gonna go through these fairly quick so that we can always go back, but I wanna make sure that we reserve enough time some, for questions and answers because uh, that's what this is all about, is, is helping you to be prepared for the next school year and to make any adjustments that you might need to. So with that, we need to look at our eligible students. We talked about the eligibility letters and the letter that you had to send out telling students in your district about the program in our last webinar, uh, part one of this. So here are some of the things that we have to know about an eligible student. They do have to be enrolled in at least one high school class. So if we're thinking about our shared time students that we have, they do have to be enrolled in one high school class at the public school. Uh, homeschool students are not allowed to enroll into dual enrollment without going through a public school. So that's why I wanted to mention the shared time because if you do have those homeschool students, they can participate in dual enrollment, but they have to be enrolled in at least one high school class. They must have a parent or legal guardian who is a resident of the state. Now, last Friday, I did have this come up. If they are emancipated or a adjudicated youth or homeless, uh, they can act as their own parent because they have that legal status. So their parents may live in another state, but they do have legal status as their uh, own guardians. So they, they would be considered eligible. Uh, we talked about this the last time, they must have a letter signed by the student's principal indicating uh, enrollment and eligibility. That will become important for both you and the college and the parents. So if there's any ever questions about costs, charges, what the class is coming in as high school credit, it is my way to help negotiate or moderate those conversations. And so if I have a, that letter as you're required by statute to provide, it helps clear up a lot of those issues. 
We do have a, an exception, but this can only be for four years unless there are some very specific requirements. So if we think about those students I was talking about earlier, our adjudicated youth, uh, major illness, um, homelessness, we know those risk factors and they are eligible for that fifth year of dual enrollment. So before you go forward, Jeff, let me give you a couple um, examples connected to that and have you respond. So if I have a homeschool student that takes a choir and or band class in my school, which is permitted, um, would that count as their one class? So then we could, that student may dual enroll through us in a college level English, math, science, so on. Yes, they could, but we do have to be careful with the, the that they have to be an elective course. They cannot be a core course. Yep. Uh, that's the same for non-public students. They can only take electives. They cannot take core. But that elective course, band or choir or industrial arts could count as that elective that then opens up dual enrollment through you. Yes, through they the just public. couldn't take a, say, a English 101 or, you know, and that type of stuff, because that is considered, uh, in other words, they can't apply it towards the Michigan 18 Merit. credit requirements of the Michigan Merit curriculum. Yep. Um, you're, so just like an AP be, class could be considered beyond the MMC college level, schools could interpret that as an elective. Yes. Okay. Second question then specific to the last point. Um, there was a period of time where we were getting fielded questions where students and parents were telling the school, we don't want our diploma. We want to stay in high school for one more year, even though mm -hmm. they fulfilled their high school requirements in four years. So their thought was if they stay for a fifth year, take one class at their local school, the public school could pay for them to go to college during their fifth year. This part of the law says, no, you can't stick around for the school to underwrite the cost of your fifth year of high school, if you will, through taking courses. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, and their clock starts with their enrollment in the ninth grade. So as soon as they've enrolled in ninth grade in any, di any district, if uh, and we'll make this easy, if their UIC shows that they enrolled in ninth grade in X year, that starts the clock. So even if they're, unless they're the, those exceptions uh, and, um, but yeah, th there's no hanging out or oops, I failed my, one of my MMC classes so I can stick around type thing. Their, their clock starts with the enrollment into their ninth grade year. Thank you. There's a couple of things that we can talk about when it comes to academic readiness in qualifying scores, we do have, the districts have the ability to look at PSAT, 9, 10, any of the state assessments for academic readiness in the subject areas tested. So when we talk about this, that's English and math, basically. If they do not have that qualifying score for college, the district may decline their dual enrollment uh, the student cannot cannot make the district pay for that dual enrollment course if they do not have an academic readiness score. I, I also want to state that it is not the district's uh, issue to have them retest. So if the parent wants to pay for the assessment to get that qualifying score that is on their dime, it is not it is not on the school district. Then the one that we talk about a lot, or at least I talk about a lot when I'm talking with counselors and, and others, is when we do the counseling part for dual enrollment, since this can start at the ninth grade, we have to look at other factors And when we're counseling the, that parent. Is the student socially mature enough to actually handle college material and the college setting? There is a big difference between high school and college when it comes to the supports. In college, nobody is paying attention to where they're at. Uh, they're not going to you know, be calling parent up and saying, hey, Jeff missed, wasn't paying attention in the last two classes. I don't know what's going on. That, that doesn't happen in college. And they're not supposed to provide those supports. So 
one of the things that we have to realize is that when we talk about college readiness, especially with special needs students, colleges are different. They do not have to provide the same um, when IEP supports that a, high, a college, uh, sorry, me, a school district needs to provide. They fall under a different realm because when the students step into that college setting, they are considered adults. Those are things that I would look for when I, if I was back in the district, uh, I did look at attendance. I did look at other factors and bring those up with the parent. If Colin's missing every Thursday afternoon, I'm not going to sign him up for a college class because he's going to be missing every Thursday afternoon. Uh, if the student has taken virtual classes in the high school and has not done well, those are things that we should bring up. We need to bring up to the parents to say, hey, if you start this, remember that their college transcripts do start. Are you sure that your student is, is ready? Uh, you can highly advise, I would note it, if the parents still insist, just like every everything else this day with student rights, there's not much we can do to stop them, but we do want it noted because as you'll find out later, and I'll bring this up, if the student is not successful, the parent shall reimburse the district. So we, we want to make sure that they're, they're, they know that that's coming up. Uh, well, I'll bring that up later. A couple of quick things we'll run through. We already kind of talked about qualifying scores. I did leave this slide in. I'm not going to address it much. Uh, I just wanted you to have it as part of the deck so that you saw where those things were coming from. So that uh, they are basically for the subjects of, of math and English. And so that if a student wants to take, as an example, a computer science class or a foreign language class, those, those are allowable and there's no assessments for those. So this slide's basically there for you to reference back to on qualifying scores. We have to think about credit considerations. The, the student gets to designate how their college credit's gonna come in. Uh, they can't audit a class, so they have to get the college credit. They can also uh, expect to receive high school credit, or they can do both. They do not have to do it for high school credit, but they must take the college credit because for them to get dual enrollment, they have to be participating in a class that is credit bearing. We'll see that come up later. If they take it for uh, high school credit, the school district has to grant the credit, but it is up to your district policy and how that is relayed. There's things that you should be in policy or your procedural statement saying that if we take this class, it's going to come in as this. If we take, um, I think Kyle and I were talking about this. This one always gets to be a little, a little controversial, so we'll, we'll start it right now. If I take an Arts 101 class, how is that coming into the district? Is it going to come in as an elective? Is it going to come in and satisfy that MMC requirement? It's going to be the district's decision. I will mention at this time, uh, those community classes, so arts may count, but painting scenery does not count. That, that has no credit bearing, so those classes don't count. And we did bring it up that the student may not audit courses if they're paid for under this. Because there is no credit, the student can't audit them. What is the district expected to do? I've kind of started to touch base on this. Um, both districts and non-public schools have to provide this in information. This is kind of unique in our system is that non-public schools to participate in this program basically have to follow all the same rules that a public school must follow. So there's no difference in this legislation between a non-public or a public school, which is kind of interesting. The only real difference comes to the paying part of it. Uh, since non-publics do not receive state aid funds, the colleges bill directly to treasury. I, I know that some of my districts that I talk to say, oh, why couldn't we bill directly to, you know, have treasury handle the, the payment, but that unfortunately doesn't work that way. I would, I, you're expected to have some parent and student meetings. They may be general. Uh, they don't have to be around dual enrollment. I would probably include those 
in those, you know, back to school or uh, career days or wrap some parent student meetings in. Uh, when we talk about that, we should also have some specifics so that those cases where I, I was talking about is a student socially mature, I would make sure that I had that parent student meeting uh, to make sure that we had that on record in case something comes up in the future. And they do have to have that eligible student letter for the district and for the district has a copy, the teacher gets a copy and one needs to go to the, the institution. Okay, we're moving right along because uh, I know the tough ones are coming up. Institutions, uh, post-secondary institutions, our state universities, community colleges, and any um, nonprofit college or university. So private universities do count. Uh, just remember that they may think so, but they do not have to match. You do not have to match their tuition rate. You are, you can spend more if you'd like, but a student cannot expect more than. Uh, typically for us in Michigan, it's about $725 a course based on uh, six courses in a semester. There are a few of you, and I'm not sure where everybody's from, but if your district does border on the state borders, uh, they can attend a university in another state, but your district must border um, that other state. There's there's a few of us that that have that. It's not very often, but it's not like a district up in my neighborhood. Uh, my kids would have gone to Meridian Public. Uh, no, they couldn't attend. I couldn't pay tuition at you know, University of Miami. Uh, my district does not border any state border. I do that college is not within uh, 15 miles of that border or the closest community college to my district. So that would not be eligible institution. I think that's an important point because there are districts that do border. So um, I know like, for example, in Southwest Michigan, Niles Public Schools is right on the border of Indiana and, and St. Mary's and Notre Dame are right across the border. Mm -hmm. And so the state law says that schools that are within a 20 mile of your district's borders are able to, you're able to use dual enrollment for. We have some districts up in the Upper Peninsula that border with Wisconsin as well, like Menominee. And so those schools would be able to um, continuous or those contiguous districts within 20 miles. Yes. But, and I'd like to, to bring this up also because of the expansion of virtual colleges and parents now seeing their student going somewhere to say University of Toledo or, or someplace just across the border. They would like their student to participate there virtually. Uh, that still is not allowed because that university is not in Michigan and the district does not border. So um, you have to use the locals. We're trying to keep Michigan money in Michigan. I didn't, but the legislators like that. So when we're talking about eligible courses, they have to apply to a post-secondary degree. So even if they're at the community college or at a regular university, that it has to be towards a post-secondary degree. I know some of our, our college community colleges are starting to get into certification programs. That is not a post-secondary degree. So the student has to be involved in a course that gives credit towards that post-secondary degree. This is one that I'm seeing coming up a lot more. And Colin, um, looking for some input here because you know your, your membership better. Spring and summer courses are okay. As long as the course is included, and this is right from our pupil accounting manual, is included in the pupil schedule during the account period and the pupil is registered for the course as the course is not, and the course is paid in full. Okay, um, we've all dealt with pupil membership. Now I'll make it a little easier. The summer classes can go, if you have a class that meets after June 30th, it will probably go on their fall schedule because that's the count period in which that class would be. You'd show that on their schedule and that would be your fall count. If the class is in April, then you're including that class in your, your February count. And so that would be on your winter schedule. So what we have to do is look at those areas. 
I know this is growing because we're having more and more students that are saying that they would like to, uh, I, I might be involved with extracurricular activities. I might have other things that I am doing either in the fall or the winter. So they're taking that summer dual enrollment course or that spring dual enrollment course, knowing that they're gonna put it on that fall schedule and reducing their, their class load at that time. So they're kind of extending their calendar year a little bit. Uh, it does still count towards that for the school district. It's not an add-on, it's something that has to appear there. I can't just come to you uh, this time of year and say, hey, Colin, I'd really like to take that spring course. Uh, I didn't make the the whatever, I didn't make the tennis team, so you know, I, I, I wanna try that. It, it's too late, that had to be on their schedule ahead of time. Oh, I don't know, Colin, if you get questions around that. Yeah, so I think I the, I what started. comes up is that oftentimes a school spring semester may start. Um, so, for example, at, if they have a May term, right? So from May in, into June is when that semester is. So that would be during most schools, second semester. Yes. Conversely, summer two oftentimes is July and August, so there may or may not be an overlap with your first semester. So as long as that course overlaps in some way, my understanding is those students could take that in lieu of a first or second semester class. Is yes. that accurate? Yes. Uh, okay, and, and I'm pretty honest. I always looked at my, I, what fiscal year did that fall in? Was, was an easy one for me. If the class was after June 30th, it, it had to go on that. If it started after June 30th, it was going on next year's membership. Uh, courses in a certification program are not eligible. And th this also goes into the trade and technical schools. So if you have a parent that wants them to go to a technical school or what we probably improperly refer to as a trade school, uh, those courses do not count because they are not part of a post-secondary degree. That doesn't mean that they can't take uh, an advanced manufacturing class, welding, construction, uh, but it has to be, a, uh, those courses have to be credit bearing at the post-secondary institution. One of the questions that came up is, has there been any conversation regarding um, the use of dual enrollment to pay for those certification classes within the trades and stuff. So as we've worked towards post-secondary education, there's been a lot of talk about rebranding, maybe is the word, rethinking what um, post-secondary education is. And so when many schools do counseling, they talk about post-secondary education as anything beyond a high school. So it could be an apprenticeship. It could be something through a trades program. It could be something through military. It could be community college. It could be a four-year college. But for purposes of dual enrollment, I believe it has to be the definition of a post-secondary institution, which is specifically a community college or a tribe that's under the state, a tribal one, a university or college or a non-public that has a degree granting. So if the certification um, were to be through, um, let's say Henry Ford Community College has a program in Megatronics. And so that program may lead to a certification and or an associate degree. If it's leading towards that, would that count or not? So I'm giving you kind of a, a blended one um, to talk about, Jeff. So. But I'm going to go from, from my experience. Uh, I'm very close to Delta College. Uh, no, <laughs> Sanford, if everybody remembers where that is, we're, we're really kind of close to Dow headquarters. <laughs> this is probably the best example I can think of is that they had a, um, chemical applications engineer certification that they're running with the state. They also have a applied science, uh, or is it, it was either arts or a associates in chemical engineering. If the class could be counted towards certification, 
and the post-secondary degree, that was good. If the class was more associated with a skill that was very specific to Dow Chemical that Delta had put it put in there and did not count towards the certificate, the, the post-secondary degree, that class would not have been allowed. Um, so th I hope that that kind of gets us where you're going, uh, Colin, is, is that it, if it's part of that associate's degree and it's it's on their, their list or the university degree, that's fine. But if it's not on that list, uh, it, it doesn't work. Right. They, so as a school, you might, or as a counselor, you may need to look at the degree granting programs within that community college or program through a university or that and determine would that course fulfill a credit bearing requirement towards that degree. And if so, it may be approved as part of that. Um, the other one I see, and I don't get this often, but it's worth mentioning, is sometimes the course will have an optional lab. That would not be, uh, the district would not have to pay for that option because it's optional. That doesn't mean that it, it is not part of the, the course requirements, but a lot of places will have an optional lab. I'm thinking sometimes in the computer sciences, they'll have an optional lab uh, that students can, can sign up for. Um, that would not be, that would be something outside the realm of dual enrollment. Thank you. Okay, courses that just aren't gonna make it. Uh, hobby, activity, or recreational courses. Um, even though I took it, uh, whitewater rafting is, is considered, an, uh, even though it was PE, it was recreational, and uh, that wouldn't be an allowable course. When we look at the difference between a hobby activity course, and this is why we brought up that arts, and I was talking about the painting community, the community colleges usually have a, a community courses catalog. They might have painting, travel, um, things that we consider more of a, it's an activity or hobby, but it's not necessarily going to leave part of a post-secondary degree. It bears no credit at the college. I know up in my area that Delta offers a very good real estate exam prep course. Uh, that is in their community bulletin, but it is not credit bearing, so that would not count. We have to be very careful about theological divinity or real religious courses. That doesn't mean that they can't take a, a religious course, but it has to be, uh, it can't be secular. It has to be multi-secular. So when we think of my best example, I think at Western and at CMU, they have a um, religions of the Middle East or, you know, Far Eastern religions. And they talk about more than they're talking about several different religions and doing a comparison contrast. That's very different than when a private school, a nonprofit private school may say, we have a, a, a course in Christian values of the Middle Ages. That that doesn't, that's uh, very secular and doesn't take in other viewpoints, so that would not be allowed. Would it be fair to say, Jeff, that, or to categorize it as, if it's a course within like a social studies history type discipline versus at Western Theological Seminary? Um, is that, when, when thinking about theology, divin divinity, and religion, is it about that secular view or is it more like his, history of religion or um, religions of the world or things like that that come more from a historical context? It, it would, uh, history of religions when you went plural, I'm, I'm, it's not going to raise them. When, when, when you don't go plural and say history of <laughs> Christian religion, history of Muslim religion, history of are very specific. Or I, I, the one that was brought up that I have to be careful because with non-publics being able to, um, and privates being able to play in this space, that I can't have a biology through creationism. Um, that's too specific and that, that's putting a, a 
a specific religious belief into the, that course. So that wouldn't work. Um, Thank you. That's the only reason I had to, I can't do social studies. And, and like you said, Colin, just because of the, the private. Yeah, no, I think it's important to clear out that nuance. And so what I hear you say is it can't be singular, if you will, versus the plural, even if it's a historical or social studies based courses. Um, so the key is, is it about a specific religion or is it about religions um, from multiple um, secular areas? Different viewpoints is, is kind of where we have to go with that one. Um, if it's not credit bearing, it, it just isn't going to, it just isn't going to make it. Okay, so now we're going to get into the fun stuff. I'm, I'm going to let people read this. This is, uh, this opinion has been around far longer than I have. Uh, and then we'll get into to some of the nuances. I'll give you a, a moment in. I know Colin's board's going to light up with all sorts of questions in a few minutes. So if you can kind of bear with me, we'll go through a few uh, examples and then uh, we can talk. So with that definition place, there's a couple of things that I'm going to talk to before we get into the the meat of that. Uh, there's a, a few other things for eligible courses. And when we get into this area, uh, that a student doesn't need to have completed or exhausted the high school curriculum. So they can still have classes that are part of the Michigan Merit curriculum, or they may have uh, accelerated classes in that subject, but they do not have to take all of those before they can participate in dual enrollment. So they don't have to go through the full program before they're allowed to do this. One of the things that, and I like to bring this up, is that it's the student's choice, just as it is in, in other high school courses. If they want to try something, um, we've all been there. I don't know about anybody else, but I thought I was, I thought it was going to be teaching business courses. I ended up teaching science courses. Um, I wish I would have taken a shop class or carpentry class back in high school. So I had a little more experience when I do it myself. Um, probably would have saved me a lot of money and missed cuts on pile and other things around the house. Uh, so we have to allow those students to explore a little bit. And, and we, can't, we can't make them take courses just like our other electives. We can't force them down a path. Uh, when we look at this, and we'll talk, I, I want to make sure that we bring this up because this is very important. We kind of touched on it earlier, is that when we are looking at these courses, uh, this is where we get into the rigor of the class and what is being taught. And it gets into that area of a district's primary responsibility, as far as I'm concerned, is that they award credit based on proficiency for the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Uh, that is your decision. I have nothing to do with it. And uh, I'll go out on the limb and say, nobody really in our department can tell you how you decide proficiency in a course. With that said, the district is, and this is what gets important about how you are awarding high school credit in the dual enrollment, how the eligibility of these courses come in, because now there's that work of, and when we look at this, how rigorous is that course? Is it is the course of the same rigor as, or more rigor than that high school course? The reason I say that is now, if we're looking at one credit courses, um, and I'm, I'm stepping out on a limb here, and, and this is may get a little confusing, but we do have one credit courses at the college level. You may decide that our course of that is similar and contains more rigor and content than that course. The, the ones I'm thinking of may be in the arts, or I know now some, some colleges are doing what they call minis and they're eight week courses. Uh, they may bear one credit so that they can, they can count them for 
some type of financial assistance, but they are really not the depth and breadth of a high school course. Those would be ones that I would go through this, this statement, uh, have my, my survey done and showing that the course, the high school course is more rigorous and has added learning objectives than that, that little one credit course. Uh, when it comes to AP courses, they typically do not meet this the, the same as a college course since the student the AP credit is based mostly on the exam and not on the course content. The exception would be is if you have a school that uh, if they wanted to attend, and I just found this out yesterday, I haven't tracked it down, but Lansing Community College considers some of their courses the, the equivalent of an AP course. That would, that would give you some grounds to go back, look at the rigor and relevance of your AP course compared to that Lansing Community College course. If you have determined that there's, there's more rigor and learning objectives that are covered than the LCC course, then you would have grounds to deny that. Basically, when I looked at that scenario, it's because Lansing Community College has already come out and said, this is an AP course equivalent. So let's take um, pause there for a minute. Um, one of the things I think is important that um, people discern is the dual enrollment course being used to fulfill one of the elective credits for graduation versus an MMC credit. If the course is determined to be an MMC-based credit, and I'll use ELA as an example because it's the one I most often get, okay? In ELA, there's state standards across multiple dimensions. You have listening, speaking, reading, writing, literature versus, and so on, language and all those pieces. The standards in Michigan are set up in ELA from 9-10 for high school as well as 11-12, okay? So some schools offer an English 9, an English 10, an English 11, an English 12. And so in order to fulfill the four credits of ELA, they need to cover the content within those academic standards. Some districts then have an honors track, English 9 honors, English 10 honors, um, English 11 honors, English 12 honors, which is just an honors version of the state standards. The third option that I see people using is English 9 honors, English 10 honors, and then they go into AP language and composition, which is really focused in on the um, um, writing and language standards within the, and then in English 12, replacing it with an AP literature which then goes over those others. So if the school is saying they've determined that AP language and AP literature, as an example, are covering the equivalent of the um, English 11 and 12 standards, and that student wants to go dual enroll in an alternative course that doesn't fulfill those same standards, the district, um, my question then would be, does the district have to approve the course? Yes, you can go take this dual enrollment course in, um, that's in the literature department at the university, but it is as an elective course versus as an MMC English course. That's something a district could determine, correct? It, it's going to be very difficult for a district to determine that because uh, in English and math, they're fairly sequential. So depending on the, the rigor of the college course, the student may not be able to, the student would have to have demonstrated those proficiencies already before they're in that college course. So then that, that college course is more advanced. Uh, so that's where we the get- The denial that I'm getting at is, if I deny this dual enrollment course because it doesn't, for the purposes of fulfilling the Michigan Merit Credits, because it doesn't address enough of those MMC standards, it's permissible by the district. 
I would, um, I would, it would have to get very course specific because if you're taking a, a, an accelerated college course is expected that you're going to know how to do punctuation. I, I, I know a, a poor example, but you know, th that what we think of a ninth, 10th grade skill uh, has to have been demonstrated to be successful in that college course. Uh, it's kind of like mathematics. If I, if I, and I know Pardon the example, but I know it's really kind of basic, but uh, I can't solve for a single variable problem without having a knowledge of how multiplication and division works. Does that mean that I, I, I'm saying that that content standard is, it may not have been taught, but I've already shown proficiency in it. So the district, it's, it's going to be very, it's a, a two-edged sword, because if you say that that class exists only in this realm, then if a student is highly successful in a, comes to you and is successful in 11th grade year, but is not, does not show that they have that ninth grade English credit, um, you can say the student has demonstrated prof proficiency for the ninth grade class because they've already gotten here. So it, it's one of those, you, you gotta be real careful of, of how you wanna do that because uh, a, 10th grade honors class, may, is that the same as the 11th grade English class? Because it's a question that I'm getting at, Jeff, and I this see. is the piece that becomes a sticky wicket. Yep. And I'll give the math example as an alternative. In math, the fourth year math in the senior year can be any math related. There's right. no specific standards. So if I want to dual enroll in an architectural drawing class, a CAD class, a megatronics class, something like that at a dual enrollment, that's permissible and it may be, fulfill the fourth year math class. Yes. But if I don't have in my first three years, my first math credit, second math credit, third math credit, enough of the math credits because it's not specific courses, and they haven't fulfilled that, then I could require that student. You need to take something that's going to round out the learning of those academic standards. If the in order to count for your in order to fulfill the fourth math credit, because those four credits have to address all of those academic standards or whatever the district determines is the all within that math, unless a personal curriculum out. If the course is at the university in the math department, yes. But if the course is not in the math department, then you couldn't do that. Correct. That's what I'm getting at. So right. this is when our thing's counting towards the Michigan America, because that's where people tend to not start. So first, I think sometimes it's easier to say, is this a course that falls under the Michigan, as a credit, is the student going to use this course to fulfill one or more of the 18 credits defined within the Michigan Merit Curriculum? And if the answer is yes, then a district needs to determine, does it fulfill enough of those MMC standards to award a credit in that discipline? And, and that goes right back to this statement. Um, Based on district policy, you know, how are we going to kind of going to count that class? Uh, and the reason that that this can get tricky, Colin, is and others is how are you treating that in district policy? When we talk about that fourth year math course, oh, did I go too far? Oh, you're too far back. Oh, sorry, hit the wrong arrow. So when you're, the district is deciding that in their policy uh, on that fourth year, especially, are you allowing that? Are you, you can't say, oh, we're gonna count accounting as a fourth year math credit at the high school, then say, oh, but we're not gonna count accounting to fulfill that fourth year math requirement if it's a dual enrollment course. So there's where you have to be, you have to make sure your policy, you know, whatever was said in page, 10 agrees with your, what you're going to say in page 20. Um, so it, that's why that one gets really kind of tricky because it's going to, 
it's going to matter a lot on how your district is treating that that fourth year class. How is your district setting up their proficiencies? How are they how are they treating that testing for credit? All of those things are kind of interrelated. So it, I wish it was an easy, you know, either split the wood or you didn't, but it, it gets a little trickier. Yeah. The easy answer is if they're using it for elective credit, then then it then you must approve as long as it's not hobby, craft, mm -hmm. recreation, so on. So yeah. if it's an eligible course and the student saying this is an elective beyond the required courses of 18, the easy answer is yes, you approve it as long as they're an eligible student, an eligible course, and so on. If it's being used as a graduation requirement as one of the defined MMC credits, that's when the nuances come in there yes. based on the eligible course, what it's being counted for, what it's not. So I use the math as an example, fourth year math doesn't have to be in a math department. So right. if I take something outside the math department, it can fulfill that fourth year math. For ELA, which is the one that's most often I get asked about, you know, because there's 9, 10, and 11, 12 standards, are enough of those standards being covered? So that's when the tricky part comes. So going back to what you said, does it match what the district says about credit for those courses? Yes. Um, um, and then we have to look at in your language, is, uh, communication class wouldn't necessarily be in an English class, but it's going to cover some of those credits and, and you may give them. Uh, and this always gets into that bigger picture. And I, I really like people to think about, remember, you decide proficiency. Uh, and so how you want to work this out is, is don't, don't constrain yourself really tight here. And then you don't have the ability to go and blend here. Uh, one of our, the examples of a course, an AP course that meets is we have a school down south and I, I always forget where it's at. The guy has combined an AP history and AP English together. So he uses the historical stuff in the history class to drive the writing in stuff of the English class. Well, now you're fulfilling two things at the same time. So if a student is looking at something like that, the district could not, well, should not substitute a social studies class for that on their schedule, if that makes sense, or an English class for that on their schedule, because there's much more rigor and in information in that, that course than there would normally be. We have to just, uh, I don't like legislation. Um, I've always been a fan, the less of it, the better. If, if I could, if I had a $5 million, I'd, I'd pay an outside firm to go through and give them 20 bucks a word they could get rid of in the school code and go from there. But uh, we want to be careful of how we do that, because then if you have, uh, if you're doing, like you said, you're, you're awarding proficiency for some of those blended courses. You don't want to set your, you know, limit yourself in the dual enrollment and then find now you've limited yourself in other areas. Um, there is a question that um, came up that it's a short answer. I just type, but I'll have you maybe elaborate on um, when it comes to credit. So is a semester dual enrollment course equivalent to a high school year long course or is it up to a district to decide? So the short answer is it's up to a district. The reason I'm going to have you talk about it is that knowing some districts are on a four block schedule, so each semester course might be a one credit class or on trimesters where they're each getting a half each. Um, so talk about some of the nuances and specifically the district's local decision on that. So it, it's uh, you're very right on point, Colin. It is up to the district. I, I have no say in that because remember, just like what we were talking about. How much proficiency is this course gonna, gonna, gonna bring? If you're deciding that, uh, and I'll just go with the typical, the typical I'm seeing now is, um, except for, unless they've specifically called it out in policy, uh, any course that is three credits or less counts as one, uh, course for course, any credit four or more counts as two. Or I see it the other way. We don't care. It's course for course, flat out. 
and that that's done. Um, so that's the district of choice. Minis you can do, it's just up to the district to, on how they want to cover the, that proficiency. If you're on trimesters, it's the same thing. That gets a little weird. Or if you're on quarters, like I said, uh, let's say a student were to take. So, for example, if a student's taking a class in a music department, yep. um, a percussion class, um, a marimba, like for marimba or a trumpet class to specialize more in that, most of those classes are one credit classes. Put a district. Um, say that a student must have two or three of those in order to count as a high school level class? Yes. Yes, because there's not enough content to, to uh, the district has decided that there's not enough content in that eight week course to merit, you know, it only merits a quarter credit. Just those are those little nuances we want to yep. tease out with that. So thank you. I've thank got, you. let me just, We've talked about, I'm going to mention this real quick. Um, basically, these top three are what a district, the 700 or whatever that the fee is, can cover. Um, hint, hint, hint on this third one, material fees in, in books. I would highly recommend that you lease them from the college because those text and materials are now the same as any text and material from the district. They are the district's property. Uh, it just makes it a whole lot cleaner from what I've heard is when we lease those from the, uh, the electronic version right from the college uh, and take care of that. Yeah. Um, so in the last time we were together, we talked about fees and that type of stuff. So you had made clear that, for example, parking fees or um, recreation fees, those things don't count, but registration fees do. Um, My ticket at Grand Valley because I parked on the left side instead of the right. No, you don't cover that either. Right. So those are things. The, the other question that came up um, that I want you to, if you could um, address, is a student who takes the class or enrolls in a class but doesn't complete it. So we, you noted that that student um, needs to reimburse the district, but is it then the district's responsibility to reimburse the state because technically that student wasn't full-time then, or how does that work? No. They're expected to reimburse the state, but the state is not coming back uh, to dock you an FTE because just like any, uh, if you think our pupil account or pupil membership is a snapshot, so there's a snapshot at that time, just like any other student in the district, just they're there that was it first Wednesday in October. If they leave you two weeks later um, and go to another district, that, that's a whole other nuance, but no. Uh, so in this are, case, if, if you paid your $725 or whatever that prorated portion of their FTE to the university, the student doesn't complete the course, the parent and or guardian student is responsible to reimburse the $725 back to the yep. district, but the district doesn't have to refund that to the state. Correct. Thank um, you. And that it, that's the district's option, whether they want to, to push for that reimbursement or not. Uh, that just gets into those subtle nuances. Like if, if the student had a medical emergency death and, you know, parent died, there may be other reasons that the district is saying that we're going to waive that um, under other parts of the, that statute. Uh, I've got one more slide that I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to bring this up. Please, if you're thinking of doing this, let me know. We can help. I can help you set it up. But what we've talked about in the last two series is what a student can is required, the district is required to provide. So all of this stuff is, is basically the student can advocate and say, I want this, and you have to provide them. I want to bring up that dual enrollment because we're seeing this gain more and more because you don't want to start an early middle college program, but you still want to offer a dual enrollment program that may be more advanced than the 10 courses. When we get to that, uh, that is the district's choice. You can start setting that up and it is very specific to how the district is, wants to do that. When we talk about an enhanced dual enrollment, it does have to have be related to a program. So now is when, uh, if it's not in the student's EDP, 
I can't help you. But if it's in the EDP, that is my definition of a plan program. Um, like I said, I'm not going to add anything to these regulations and laws that we don't need. So the law said plan program, the law says an education development plan. To me, that seems like they're synonymous. Um, so if it's part of a student's plan, they can exceed the 10. But that would be up to you. I'm thinking of our, our future proud Michigan educators. You may you may have a, a 12 course thing in there. We have uh, Centerline and some others are doing these wrap around, you know, three at the high school, at the high school, one at the college. So there's some of these wrap around programs, three and ones, that type of thing, that aren't truly a dual enrollment, but they are a, what we call enhanced dual enrollment because it, the district has chosen that that's the best placement for the student to be there and exceed the 12. So you really get to drive that one. Um, I just wanted to make sure it's out there. If somebody would like to learn more about doing that. Um, I'll throw up my, well, I can do that right now. I can throw that up. Uh, this is what I can do to help. So just reach out and I'm glad to help you with the district. And um, there's my, you know, not like most department people, I'm not afraid to have you call me. So you'll see my cell phone's in there, uh, feel free. I, I might not be able to get back to you right away, but I do try to return those as soon as I can. Uh, back to you, Colin, let's, let, to wrap us up. Yeah, so thank you for um, joining us today, Jeff, and um, working through some of these. Um, I know it can be a sticky wicket, and you get phone calls from parents when schools aren't as open to dual enrollment as um, a parent would like. And so what we wanted to do is make sure we address what you shall do and what you may do. And so it's really a matter of um, how do we continue to provide students a rigorous and relevant piece? So as we think about careers and their educational pathways to it. What can we do to enhance opportunities for our students? And what is the minimum you must do? And what are the opportunities beyond? And so during the Q&A, we also address some of the things that districts may allow, as an example, students to do in wrong courses. Maybe they didn't have a qualifying score, particularly those things that might be through a CTE program and stuff. It's just the law provides some minimum standards and some exceptions, like the religious divinity theological type base courses, um, mainly because of Michigan's constitution around separation of church and state, um, specific to not public dollars for non-public um, pieces that way. So with that, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, we will put out a email later this week that has a link to the recording for this webinar, as well as the slide deck that has some hyperlinks built into it. I would encourage you to utilize the MDE website. They've um, Jeff and crew have really done a nice job of updating that and um, providing sample letters, the calculators, an FAQ that goes through many of the things that were addressed today, but being able to read it might help you as you tease things out. Um, and as Jeff said, you're always welcome to contact him via email phone. You can also contact us at MASSP and we will support you with that. So with that, we wish everybody a safe and happy spring and we look forward to um, seeing people at our next event.